but it's been a while since I've been amongst you guys, and for most of you, I'm probably a new face. There's a few faces I recognise, so great to see you guys again. And please make yourself known to us before we leave today, to my wife, Steph, and the family, and, and that'd be great to, to get to meet some more new people. Um, I'm very grateful that Pastor Stewart's given me the opportunity to speak to you this, this afternoon. I almost said this morning, I'm so used to that. But if, uh, if I'm going to preach well, I'm, we need to pray, so let's pray. Father, we just thank you so much for the opportunity to look at these things together. Lord, they encourage us, they lift our spirits, they help us to see you in a more incredible way. So Lord, I pray you help me to speak clearly and to um, prepare everyone as we look into your word this morning. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Would you like me to have a different angle on this? No? Okay, so it's uh, this particular topic that Pastor Stuart wants me to speak on is something pretty close to my heart. It's the 77s, or the 70 weeks, sometimes called that, of Daniel. So this is one of the key Bible passages that got me excited about God's Word, and about how amazing it is, and therefore how amazing God is. And the other thing that I know is that you are a well-taught church, so I can really get right into things today, and, and I know you'll come with me, won't you? Yes. I hope you'll come with me, good. Of course, you, you need to not just accept what I say, I've got to say this caveat, please don't just accept what I say, but look into it yourself, and um, see what the Bible actually says, and... Uh, yeah, that's, that's just standard and my standard, but hopefully we can tie in a few things that we see happening in today's world as we see it illuminated by God's Word. Okay, we've got a fair bit of territory to cover today because I want to set, up, set us up to be able to get some really good stuff out of Gabriel's prophecy. That's what we see in Daniel 9 at the end of it there. He's speaking to Daniel. So, and although the culmination of this time, the 77s that we're talking about, is when we're not going to be here because the church will be raptured first. Nonetheless, if we can see that day approaching, we are, as we're expected to do in Hebrews 10.25, then we can be wise and make good decisions about you know, our lives now because we know what the future generally will look like. And that's where Jesus would love the church to be, making wise decisions, to be characterised by discernment and wisdom in our day as we see the spirit of the evil age welling up, uh, we need to be recognising and act accordingly with godly perception and, and sensitivity. So in order to set us up for that, I first want to give us something of an overview of the book of Daniel, because we've got till like five o'clock, haven't we? So that should be good. Yeah, all right. Now, because what we read at the end of chapter nine leans heavily on what came earlier in the book, most specifically, it's a series of dreams that uh, God gave to both King Nebuchadnezzar early on in the Jewish exile, very early, and then to Daniel quite a bit later during the Persian phase of his captivity. And these dreams all ultimately relate to the same topic, which is the time of Gentile rule over Israel, and, and often much more, but the centre of the focus is Israel. Um, just It's broader scope than that, but the focus is Israel. And when taken together, these dreams, there's three of them, they combine to give us a great view of the big picture of prophecy for God's plan for Israel and for the world. And so rather than go into great detail, we haven't got time for that, we're going to take the, you know, the 30,000 foot view today and pick out some key points and lead us to something important to recognise going forward. And we're going to summarise it in this table. So I, know if, I don't know if you take notes or anything, but um, feel free to to try as we follow along. You might say what table, um, but I promise it's coming, it's going to build it up bit by bit. Now I know it's tempting to identify all the kingdoms, it talks about uh, at the beginning rather than later, but what I think is the more biblical approach is to identify them as scripture does, so let's not jump the gun, we're going to go systematically through this. And if we do that, we're going to get a more accurate picture of what God is communicating, I believe. And yes, there are five there. There's four in the statue and then one that wins in the end. I think you know what that one is, but we'll save that for a bit later. So the first dream is described for us in chapter 2. So this is Nebuchadnezzar's famous dream of the big statue. That's why we've got the picture up there of that. And the first kingdom is the head of gold. We're told in 
in chapter 2 there, verses 37 and 38. So you can follow along. Do recommend it in your Bibles. So we're told in 37 and 38 that this represents Nebuchadnezzar himself. And therefore, by extension, we say the Babylonian kingdom, the Babylonian, Babylonian empire. Because the Bible often represents a kingdom by its main ruler and vice versa. It can be either way. But at any rate, it's safe to say that the head of gold is identified as, as the kingdom of Babylon. There, and it's ruled by the greatest king, Nebuchadnezzar. It's first, or not first king, but first in this exile. Which incidentally may be something that Nebuchadnezzar took a bit the wrong way and got a bit proud with, because we read in the next chapter, you know, he set up the big statue of gold and all that kind of thing and uh, had everyone bow down to it. So that kind of sets us up for the big the story about Shadrach and all, and all his buddies. But that's a story for some other day. But I suspect Nebuchadnezzar got a bit big for his boots with the whole, you're the head of gold thing. And so I suspect that might be a connection there. But at any rate, that's the first kingdom. And the next one is the arms of chest, sorry, arms and chest of silver. Notice silver is a little bit less valuable than gold. And you'll notice that each of these materials gets less valuable as we go down. But at the same time, they get harder and tougher. So there's, I think there's communicating something there as well. But as for the kingdom of silver, we're not told much else at this point other than that it's inferior to Babylon. So we'll move on to the next one, which is the belly and thighs of bronze. That's the third kingdom. And again, we're not told much else. So then we'll go to the fourth kingdom. And we're again, not told, well, we actually we are told a lot about this one, quite a bit, here and in the rest of Daniel. But as for chapter two, it's mostly here that it's just it's two legs. And then the legs have 10 toes. But that's all we have to identify at this stage. Okay, so then we see this other kingdom, which is not part of the statue, but instead comes in as a flying stone and destroys the statue completely. That's, uh, then that's described in verses 44 and 45 as a kingdom that will fill the whole earth and will never be destroyed. Which is, I like that one. That's cool. Uh, so it's pretty clear that this is the kingdom of God, right? And the rock is Jesus when he returns. And he's going to deal with the, the rest of the kingdoms. I don't think any decent scholar disputes that. So we can safely put the identification there, the kingdom of God. Okay, so now when we get to the next dream, so that's dealt with the, the dream in Nebuchadnezzar's dream. The next dream is the one in Daniel, well, further in Daniel 7, that he has many years later when he's an old man. And King Belshazzar who's the last king of the Babylonian Empire, was in charge. So this one involved a whole new set of symbols, but it covered the same basic information. So the kingdoms which would rule over God's promised land from that time forward. And we find it, like I said, in Daniel chapter 7, and where we read in verse 4 that the first kingdom, which we already know is Babylon, we figured that out, that's represented as a lion with eagle's wings. So I think this kind of symbolizes majesty and speed of conquest, the kind of those two aspects to it there. Then the second kingdom, moving nice and quickly here, is described in terms of a bear, which is up on one side with three ribs in its mouth. But again, no specific name is given. So we'll move on then to the third kingdom, and that's mentioned in verse 6, and it's a leopard with four wings and four heads. So keep that number four in mind because that helps us in identification of this a bit later. But we still have no formal identity here in chapter seven. So I, I treat this like a puzzle. We're just trying to put the pieces together as we go. So I hope that's how you see it. And the fourth kingdom is again more thoroughly described. It's called terrifying and it's different from all the rest. So it's, it's unique somehow. We'll talk more about that in the bulk of our sermon, and it has iron teeth. In fact, iron is a big factor here in the makeup of this beast, as is the number 10. So here it's described as having 10 horns. Remember before it was 10 toes. So these line up horizontally as the same kingdom. So yeah, uh, again, we have no proper identification yet. But we do get some good intel on the final kingdom, just to reinforce our previous 
identification of this one as the kingdom of God through Jesus Christ is brought about by the Ancient of Days, who we usually take as a title of God the Father. But this time we're told that his saints will be part of the ruling ones in this kingdom, but, but uh, the highest ruler who will remove all previous kingdoms and reign in his own right from that time forever onward will be one like a son of man, it says there, who of course is Jesus. So we can be pretty sure on that one. And I, for one, I'm glad this is the ultimate future we have to look forward to because the kingdoms now leave a lot to be desired. I think you would agree with me. Anyway, we'll move on. And now we get to Daniel's second vision. So this is the third dream we're going to look at and final one in chapter 8. So this happened two years later, and it finally gives us some answers. So I like this one. But it only gives it for two of the kingdoms. So it begins with the second kingdom and represents that as a ram with two horns. And one of the horns is longer than the other. And as you can see, this corresponds with the previous lopsided bear, so the bear was up on one side. And also the two arms on Nebuchadnezzar's statue. So there's, there's duality here in this kind of kingdom. Which all falls into place when we see it formally identified in verse 20. It's actually list, named as the Medo-Persian Empire or the Medes and the Persians. But we tend to call it the Medo-Persian Empire, sometimes just the Persian Empire, because as uh, the whole thing for the lopsided thing is that the Persians took over and became more powerful. So that's why it had those pictures there with the uh, bear on one side and the, the one longer horn. And just in passing, the three ribs, since I mentioned them there, they, they stand for the three kingdoms they defeated to take power. And they're generally considered by scholars to be Lydia and Egypt and, of course, Babylon, who they directly took over from in the area of Judea. Well, sorry, it was back then, was it still Israel? Um, so that's great. We can lock that name in for the second kingdom. And then we get to the one which took over from them, which was the fast-moving goat, and with a single prominent horn that becomes four. Okay. So there's that number four again. I remember I said to look out for that. That's because the kingdom in view here is named for us in verse 21 as Greece. And thus history shows us that the prominent horn is Alexander the Great, who died in his early 30s. And so the kingdom was divided up between his four main generals. So the one horn became four. Remember, this was all written by Daniel before any of this happened. So just so you know. So yes, we can identify that kingdom on our chart with biblical confidence, Greece. Okay, so that's a quick skim overview, but you get the key points, the highlights of all those dreams, and they give us a good framework to work from, for these kingdoms. But there's still something missing. I've got a question mark on there, so just to give you a point to what it is. There is no formal identification of the fourth kingdom. We've got all the rest, but God in his wisdom has chosen not to name this fourth kingdom for us. Is there a reason for that? This is God's word, so yes, there's a reason. You don't always know the reason, but let's have a talk about this. Now, having studied this for quite a while now, I would suggest that there is a very good reason that's not named in Scripture. I would suggest it's because this kingdom is not so much a ge geographical nation or a king as it is an ideology. The Bible did say this kingdom was different from all the others, right? We saw that earlier. That was in chapter 7. Now, an ideology can work itself through different human kingdoms, and we see that uh, this, this and that there have been several kingdoms which have held sway over the region of Israel since the time of the third Greek kingdom. So oh, no, the third kingdom on that list there, the Greek kingdom. But what I think we're going to see is that the kingdoms under this banner, this fourth one, one way or another, find their fullest and final expression in this ideology. Now, of course, the traditional answer is that the fourth kingdom is Rome. And I, I don't disagree with that. So I'll put that on the table. We'll start with Rome. But mentally, we'll put a little asterisk there, okay? So um, we're going to talk about that. We'll get back to that. But at first glance... Rome is a reasonable identifier, especially when you consider the whole two-legged thing. And we'll look back into history from today and, and note that the Roman Empire did indeed split 
into two legs in about 330 AD. The West under Rome. Try and put the point the same side that you're watching. So I'll try to get this right. So the West to Rome, the East to the Byzantine Empire. I'll put that on the screen there. So we've got Byzantine um, under Byzantium, which became Constantinople and today is Istanbul in Turkey. So now that's more relevant to Israel because it was Israel's was part of the Eastern leg. Okay. Then later on, the Byzantine Empire got taken over by the Islamic Ottoman Empire. That was the early 1500s or so, and around the time of the Reformation. Then in the 20th century, we have the British Mandate period. And that was, of course, only for a brief time and was apparently part of God's plan to begin to return the land of Israel to the ethnically Jewish rule again, as formalised in 1948. But still at that time, and even until today, the key part, the most contested part of the real estate, the Temple Mount, is still under iron-fisted Islamic control today. So that brings me to my point here, and that is that there is something in common with all those Gentile authorities exercising control over Zion. And Arnold Fruchtenbaum, and he's someone you would have heard of, from Pastor Stewart, I'm sure, uh, he identifies the fourth kingdom or the spirit of it, at least, as the spirit of imperialism. So how he names it. And imperialism is the ideology of conquering and colonising lands perceived to be backward or underdeveloped, or just generously sometimes. And there's good reasons to see that way, see it that way. But I, I want to suggest that maybe we could identify this spirit slightly differently. Because imperialism certainly can be heavy-handed and and destructive, like it's described in Daniel there. But it can also be quite benevolent, benevolent too. So let's look back. What is distinctive about this fourth kingdom from the three who ruled over Israel before it? Well, the Babylonians were pretty harsh and they wiped out Jerusalem and they exiled the Jewish population. But the Jews still did live together and they were able to maintain and practice their religion while in Babylon. Well, as much as they could without a temple to sacrifice in and all that stuff. But there was a time when Nebuchadnezzar required everyone to bow down in front of the big gold statue that we talked about before. But in the end, that passed and Nebuchadnezzar actually came to proclaim his belief in the God of Israel as the Most High God. And I'd take that as genuine from what we can read. So by and large, the Jews and other nations too could retain their religion and their general societal structure while Babylon ruled. And then the Persians were even more generous because Cyrus sent them all home to rebuild the temple. And later on, Artaxerxes Longimanus found, uh, funded them, actually, to rebuild the whole city of Jerusalem. Um, and more about that a bit later. So they were still under the rule of the Persians. The Persians were the boss, you could say. But they were free to express their own culture and religion in their own land again. So they had quite some freedoms. Then when the Greek Empire came, there were a few oppressive times again, such as when um, Antiochus Epiphanes, he did all these things. But they had the Maccabean Revolt and they got a certain amount of freedom again. So it's just to keep that idea, there's still a bit of freedom they have. So what is different with the fourth one from Rome onwards? Well, the Romans were the first ones to formally re remove autonomy from the leadership of, of Israel and assume full authority themselves. And they specifically sought to Romanize life more thoroughly too, buildings and culture and uh, government, the whole thing. And they made a show of trying to you know, let the Jews have their own control, but they really didn't. And a key moment we can see this is when the Jews finally lost the legal right to put anyone to death. This was seen as the scepter departing from Judah, which they mourned greatly. There was a big thing happened in the, um, the first decade of the first century which of course paved the way for Jesus' crucifixion to happen the way it needed to, with the execution, the way they did things there, with the crucifixion and all that. But the point is, here we see the pounding up and grinding into the ground of the places that Rome took over, especially Israel, and especially in 70 AD, where Jerusalem was pretty much ploughed under. Um, they built some things as well, of course, but in their own way. Um, 
Okay, so it's just that spirit of crush, crushing things under is common here. So how should we identify this spirit or this kingdom? Well, I would propose that the fundamental element of this fourth kingdom is a progressively increasing totalitarianism. That's the key thing, I think, totalitarianism. It's more than just tyranny. It is that, but it's, it's an extreme version of that. And it's stronger than being just authoritarian. It's the complete control by one ruling person or an elite class over every part of life, going right into the private lives of its citizens. And of course, there's been varied, varying degrees of that, but it's the spirit behind it and the ultimate goal of what this is, is what we're concerned about here. Now, you could argue that totalitarianism is not a specific ideology as such, because there can be several ideologies that express themselves in that way. There's communism, fascism, and Islam, and even aberrant Christianity can express itself that way, not, not just Catholics, but Protestants too. Um, there's, you know, what Calvin did wasn't particularly great in Geneva, in some ways. But like I said before, I would suggest that each of these are simply different paths to the same ends. They all meet in the anti-freedom of totalitarianism in their ultimate expression. That is, there is a desire in them all to dominate people and for those in charge to be at the very least respected, if not feared, or if not worshipped. So up to this point in history, though, the totality of their control has typically been limited by the available resources. And as the resources increase, the potential damage in abusing them does too. And we can see this mindset as an expression of the original lie in the Garden of Eden, actually. So we're going to look at that if you want to flick to Genesis 3. But think about what did Satan tempt Eve with? Well, is, let's go and read it. This is really important. So Genesis chapter 3, verses 1 to 5. What did Satan tempt Eve with? Now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. I better put this up for you, sorry. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees of, in the garden. But God said, you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden. Neither shall you touch it, lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die. For God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. You will be like God. God has power and should be worshipped, right? The true God. So you can have that too. So they're the key elements, power and worship. But ultimately, it's Satan who has designs on these things for himself. He's just using us as means to get there. He wants the worship and power that God has, and he's been working to this end right through history. So I would argue that what we see in this fourth kingdom is the ultimate fulfillment of this plan. This is his end game. Working through willing human agents, and sometimes just ignorant or careless ones too, that can happen, he's bit by bit trying to bring the world under his full control. Yes, Jesus himself already calls him the God of this world, but God has kept him on a leash. So I've got a picture of a leash there. Plus he has genuine limitations of his own, of course. He's not God. And things that have hindered his progress. But in the end, when the restrainer is removed and he's let off the leash, the fourth kingdom will be the full expression of his disdain and his underestimation, actually, of God and for mankind as his image bearers. So this is why today I believe we are seeing this spirit, which we can identify as the spirit of Antichrist, beginning to push its way into the world more and more. We're entering into the time of the full blooming of the final Gentile kingdom of totalitarianism. That's what will be the characteristic spirit of the tribulation. Now, that's not to say we can't have another revival and God's standards surge back again. That's possible. The kingdom is brittle, remember? This um, fourth kingdom is brittle. Don't forget, it's got you know, clay mixed with iron at the feet. But still, we have to be careful not to pull up, put all our eggs in that one basket because we can lose our focus as believers if we do. And our focus should be to witness to 
and disciple anyone who would listen and about the person and ways of Jesus Christ. No matter what happens, we, we should be doing that. But at the same time, we need to do what, as I mentioned before, Hebrews 10.25 expects us to do, to see the day approaching and not be blind to the signs he gives us. And what we see in our day now is pretty wild, especially this decade, right? If you want to see examples of the test runs for the operation of the spirit of totalitarianism, just look around you over the last couple of years. Because, like I said, totalitarianism is the full control of every aspect of life, public and private, by a government, which is usually under the control of an individual or a small group. And we saw that with Hitler and with Stalin in the 20th century, and currently in places like North Korea and Cuba and Eritrea, I just discovered was one of those, a very small place, but it's totalitarian. And to an increasing degree in modern China, where interestingly the technology that what they use, it's more and more giving avenues for its grip to spread. And that's the key element that's been missing until recent decades, is the technology especially in the computing and communications power that, to manage it all. But we've come far enough with all that to be more than capable of enforcing the kind of control we see described in the beast kingdom in Revelation, with controlled economies, mark of the beast, uh, forced worship, killing of nonconformists. I mean, they've been killing from the beginning, but you know what I mean. Uh, just the, the way they can do it. Um, everything that's there in the book of Revelation is well within the realms of possibilities today. But there's another element that's necessary. And here's where we as Christians should be able to stand apart. For totalitarianism to take hold, people need to allow it. So either through fear or through great deception, or even simply just through the weakness of character or, th or, spiritual, or, you know, or spiritual conviction of the masses or lack of it, totalitarian powers can be allowed access. And the main one at the moment, I would argue, is fear. So you either create or exploit some crisis, and the people in the absence of the true God as their saviour will look to humans to save them from their fear. Haven't we seen that? Yes? So you can see in this strategy that true Bible-believing Christians who follow Jesus' commands not to fear and not to look to man for salvation... We should be largely immune from the lies, shouldn't we, really? This is the incredible power of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Without the protection of the Holy Spirit speaking through his word, we are completely vulnerable to the lies of the world and Satan. But the majority of the world is rebelling against Jesus Christ and not in ignorance. And that's the key factor why I think we're currently seeing unfolding history's biggest example of this thing called mass formation psychosis. But I've got a question mark just to keep it. I'm going to discuss this. Because as soon as you say that term to many today, they go, oh, ha, ha conspiracy nut, I can ignore you. <laughs> but we dismiss this to our detriment, I think. Now, we do need to be wise because it's a necessary prerequisite for totalitarianism to take hold properly. And along these lines, I've been reading a very recent book by a Belgian professor named Matthias Desmet. Some of you may have heard of him. Uh, he wrote this book and released it in June. It's called The Psychology of Totalitarianism. has plenty of insights in and gives more understanding into this stuff. But just so you know, two things I want to say. He's not a Christian, as far as I can tell. And by the end of the book, you can see he has some clear New Agey tendencies and thinks the way to defeat totalitarianism is just to everyone be informed and stand strong. Now, which aren't bad things. Yep, it's good to be informed and stand strong but it's just that he's completely blind to the spiritual reality behind the phenomenon he's trying to explain. He says it's kind of just happens. But, mm, I think there's more to it than that, because there is a master conspirator. It's just that he's not human. He's that ancient serpent, the fallen angel the Bible identifies as Satan. So that's one thing to keep in mind as a caveat. The other one is that the theory of mass formation psychosis can be seen to be a little bit extreme, Perhaps. He's basically saying that the vast majority of people are effectively hypnotised into believing a human ruler or structures is the only saviour from the threats that exist. Now, maybe I'm ex exaggerating slightly. He said 20 to 30% of people might be under that. That's what he said. But he says it gets them so they're basically hypnotised. 
And I think we need to take into account that many who are responding irrationally are doing so out of innocent trust of structures that they've always just been happy to believe in before. And most of us can relate to that. You know, uh, we, We've generally been able to say that government we grew up with, while far from perfect, that's no, no doubt about that, but you know, generally, uh, by and large, would maintain our Judeo-Christian -Christi principles and freedoms, generally speaking, uh, as long as we've been around. We could rely on them for that. Our media has historically been fairly balanced-ish. You know, it used to be able to watch the ABC News and not feel like it was propaganda anyway. <laughs> I hope that's all right to say that. Our scientific and medical institutions and experts could be trusted to actually do real science. Yes, their adherence to evolution skewed things quite often, but they were kind of morally at least neutral. So you can understand, my point being, you can understand the general bank of trust that the average person has built up, rightly or wrongly. So when that, all the advice from these places points in the same direction, uh, why would you argue? You know? But I think it's become clear that all of these things have in one way or another revealed themselves as corrupt. And to be frank, none of them are really worthy of our trust. So my point is that mass formation psychosis doesn't need to be invoked to explain it all. And no one should get smug about slapping that label on others just to make yourself feel better. Okay, that's kind of what I'm trying to say here, I guess. The main issue is that the ruling elites of this world are unified in their narrative. And most of us haven't the understanding, the courage, or the resources to fight back efficiently in the natural. But that said, I think there is still some truth to the mass formation theory. So it seems that Bible supports some aspects of it. So I'll quickly touch on Desmond's summary here. So mass formation psychosis is when a significant percentage of a population, like it says 20 to 30%, are deceived into believing a person or power can be the, their saviour from their fears. And they act irrationally as a result. So that's the psychosis aspect. It happens because they've allowed themselves to become inverted about what's real and what isn't, and what's reliable and what's not, and what's truth and what's a lie. It's been all flipped over. Basically, it's Isaiah 5 verse 20 manifest on a large scale. Isaiah 5 20 says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. Who's come to that verse a lot recently? Yeah, <laughs> it's right in there, isn't it? And also the first steps of what's, this is also the first steps of what's described in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 10 to 11. You don't have to go there, I'll just bring these up for you. Which is set in the last day's context, of course. So Paul is speaking of those who are perishing because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. Therefore God sends them a strong delusion so that they may believe what is false. Or literally believe the lie. It says there. And that's interesting because there's yet another reference to this kind of widespread deception and also uses the term the lie. And that's in Romans 1. And the lie is mentioned in verse 25, but then as a result of its work, we'll just go to verse 28 for time. And since they did not see, did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So I've just shown you three references which show us that God has planned for this happen, to happen as judgment on rebellious people, which are people who don't hold fast to Jesus Christ. But how does it take hold when the truth is usually so plain to see? This is where Desmond provides some insight. He notes that, it's, that it involves a long process of those in power bringing anxiety, dissatisfaction, and division to a population. And I hope you can see that this has been happening for decades now, in many ways. So why do they push diversity so strongly? Because too much of it, I mean, some diversity is fine, but too much of it weakens social bonds and breeds distrust and misunderstandings and feet of iron and clay, anyone. You know? And why do they push tolerance? Tolerance, tolerance, tolerance. Because tolerance means you can't hold a narrow, intolerant worldview like Christianity, which is actually the truth, and which in turn means you can't stand for true morality because you can't push that truth on someone else, which leads to increasing depravity spreading, which feeds back into the weakening of the social bonds as the family unit is attacked, and that's why they're attacking family in all the ways they are now. 
the nuclear family unit being the bedrock of a healthy culture. Always been true. And it always will be true. And we see these things around us, don't we? That's why they're attacking these things. So we need to be alert and aware. And they all go in one direction, spurred on by the twin information evils of censorship of the truth and propaganda of the lie. All of these things cause the average person to be fearful, discontented, anxious, and worn out. Describe anyone? <laughs> Sometimes I feel like that. But this is when the crisis does its work. Whether it's a planned one, like I would argue the last couple of years, or a completely made up one, like human induced climate change, or just some naturally occurring one that they just exploit, that's the payday for all that groundwork laid out among the masses. So Desmond says there are three main reasons people buy into the lie of mass formation. Number one is it's a new social bond. There's now a common enemy they can, you know, collectively fight against. And they, at long last, feel part of a team for good. You know, it's something they've been longing and it fills that void. Social bond. Number two, it soothes their anxiety. So all the measures they succumb to feel good because they're doing something constructive and they become sort of a security blanket as well. It makes their anxiety lessen. And number three, they have a, an outlet for their pent-up anger and aggression, such as towards those who don't get taken in to the lies because they're, those kind of people are painted as working against the perceived good and are a threat to their newfound feelings of belonging and confidence. So this, this is what he says, Desmond says. Now, if these things sound familiar, it's because this is what happened recently. And it's going to continue to happen and increase in the future unless God does something very major very soon. But the thing we need to remember is the gospel is the true immunization from this lying spirit. One and number one, we already have a social bond, don't we? Being here this morning, it's so great seeing you guys. It's awesome. And we have that social bond and family bond. It's a huge privilege, privilege being in the family of God and meeting together in a local church. The second one, we are free from anxiety because we know God loves us and will never forsake us and that Jesus paid our debt, plus we have incredible hope for the future because of him. So we shouldn't have anxiety. Number three, all revenge and anger is in God's hands. So we shouldn't simply glory in the salvation he brings us. I'm sorry, we should. Sorry, I misread that. <laughs> we should absolutely glory in the salvation he gives us. We don't have to go and... Um, pursue revenge. That's why it's more important than ever we stand up for the truth of Christ wherever we are. He's the only answer to the ills of this sick, sick world. And he's coming back to take care of business. He's our hope, no one else. It's kind of a good place to finish there, but I'm not finished. <laughs> On that note, we finally get to the point of the sermon. Okay. That's, that was just introduction. <laughs> well, this is what Pastor Stuart wanted me to talk about, but I wanted to bring this in because it does inform quite clearly these 70 weeks. So, What does God have to tell us about the coming of his kingdom, the fifth and final one of Nebuchadnezzar's dream? Well, it's all summarised in this amazing prophecy called the 70 weeks or the 77s of Daniel. I'll try and stick to sevens because that's the, the version I've got up there. Sometimes I'll slip into weeks. But this prophecy gives us the fundamental framework for everything else the Bible says about God's plan for the end times. And I know I haven't left myself too much time to explain it, but I'll do my best to give you an overview. And in the process, I hope it brings together some of those things that we've been talking about and builds your confidence in the incredible precision and the truth of the Word of God. And the other thing I should say is that I'm going to base most of what I say on the calculations of a man called Sir Robert Anderson. He's not around anymore because he lived in the 1800s most, most of his life. So he was a Scotland Yard detective who therefore had an incredibly analytical mind. It just so happened he was a Christian too. And so he applied godly logic and a whole lot of research to this prophecy and, and published his results in a book called The Coming Prince in 1894. That's when that book came out. And you might say, that's a long time ago, Dave. And I say, absolutely it is, I know. And in all that time, no one has been really successfully able to debunk it. There is a more recent scholar from the 1970s named Harold Honer, I think is how you say it, Harold Honer, who put forward something quite similar. 
But the problems with his calculations is that they are built on the assumption of a Friday crucifixion. I hope you don't mind me saying that, but I believe that's actually incorrect. So I lean towards Anderson's conclusions. Hence, that's what you'll get this morning, this afternoon. Sorry, I slipped up, didn't I? This afternoon. Now, just to be aware, any errors that may turn out in this are only ever going to be from man's end. I'm quite sure both men are at least very close to God's intention with this, okay? So that's what God has done is perfect. We're just trying to find our way to it. So the passage in question is Daniel 9, verses 24 to 27. And the context is that Daniel is in Babylon, praying and confessing the sins of his nation because he takes the Bible seriously and he's read the writings of Jeremiah, who said that Israel will be in prophecy. Uh, in prophecy in exile, for 70 years. And he notices that 70 years are just about up. So he's praying that the angel Gabriel, or he's praying when the angel Gabriel comes to him and gives him an incredible promise from God about the future of his people, the Jews. Actually, it's, it's, it's as much a judicial sentence as a promise in that he's telling them they'll be under Gentile dominion for a long time yet, but it all has a purpose. And that's how he starts out. So verse 24 and I'm going to take this from the NIV. I, I normally preach from the ESV because it's quite literal. It saves a lot of work to explain things, but I think ESV mangles things a bit for this passage. So NIV it is this time. Verse 24, 77s are decreed for your people and your holy city to finish transgression, to put an end to sin, to atone for wickedness, to bring in everlasting righteousness, to seal up vision and prophecy and to anoint the most holy. Okay, lots there. Let's break it down. What are the sevens, firstly? As I said, sometimes it's called weeks in other translations. Well, genius, it's just a group of seven of something. Okay, it's just a group of seven. We only ever take a week to refer to a group of seven days. But in older usage, it can be a group of seven anything. So like uh, how a dozen is to 12 is a week is to seven, kind of like that. So it's a heptad, if you like, if you want to get technical. And there are 70 of them. All lined up. So what are the things being grouped into sevens, though? What are they? Well, it becomes clear it's referring to time as we go on. But what length of time? And interestingly, that's exactly what it is, a time. As in time, times, and half a time, it's in that context, it's what we read about in Daniel and in Revelation. All right, so that probably just adds more confusion. For what's a time? Well... I can't go at all the calculations for you today, but what it turns out to be is a 360-day year. And uh, our man, Robert Anderson, he gives good proof of that if you want to read the book. But 360-day year. So a time is almost a year, but not quite. So five and a quarter-ish days short. So that means we're talking about 70 groups of seven times. 70 groups of seven 360-day years, which are also called prophetic years in some circles. So this is God's clock, ticking along. Because years were originally 360 days long. When you work it out in Genesis and Revelation, it all fits perfectly. You'll see that. Okay, so how long is a seven then in days? Well, quite simple calculation. Seven times 360, 2,520 days. That's our seven. That's our measuring stick, all right? That many days. Can we really be that precise, some might ask? Absolutely, yes. In fact, we must if we're going to see what God's really telling us here. Okay, so what does he say about this centuries-long period of time, these 77s? God is saying that this is his timeline for fulfilling six purposes in Daniel, in the people and the holy city, in Daniel's people and the holy city, which, of course, are... Israel and Jerusalem, Daniel's people, and the city. So here are the six purposes listed, and I'll briefly explain each one. First one is to finish transgression. Actually, in Hebrew, it's to finish the transgression. So that gives us a clue that we're talking about something special here, the transgression. We've been talking about the Jewish nation. What would that be? Well, that's, we know with New Testament glasses, it's rejecting and ultimately killing their Messiah. But they're still rejecting him now, so they're still in the transgression. It will end when they finally accept him as a nation. Number two, to put an end to sin. That sounds a bit like the last one, 
but it has a different focus. It seems it's referring to the characterization of the nation of Israel. To put an end to sin generally would mean that they go from being ungodly in character to being godly. So they're characterized by godliness, you can say. So their national decisions will be made with God as the goal, not the world anymore. So that's perhaps what that one stands for. And th number three, to atone for wickedness. That's pretty easy. I think we know what that one is. The death of Jesus on the cross there. So his blood is the only thing that atones. Number four, to bring in everlasting righteousness. This is exactly what Jesus repeatedly said was coming, the kingdom of God to earth. And specifically with the New Testament eyes, again, we could call this the millennium, and really then on into the eternal state beyond that. And all of that time into eternity is when Jesus is reigning, bringing everlasting righteousness. So this is going to be part of that time. By, that, by the end of this time, that will have come. So number five, to seal both vision and prophecy. Actually, the Hebrew word says prophet there. So seal both vision and prophet. So no more dreams or, and visions or prophets to foretell God's truth. They won't be needed. Why? Well, it's the promise inherent in the name Emmanuel, isn't it? God with us. No one will need to speak for God in that prophetic way anymore. With Jesus on the throne of David, you can just go and talk to him. You know? He'll probably be busy, but you know, he'll make time. But we can just, God is with us, we don't need those things anymore. Number six, and to anoint the most holy, or some translations have it, the most holy place. Um, and which is, I think, is the best way of understanding it, because it's pretty clear it's talking about the temple in Jerusalem, more specifically the Holy of Holies within that temple. And I think to be fair, it would be fair to say that this will be exactly where Jesus reigns from. So it will need to be cleaned up and prepared. So we have to prepare it there. Okay, so each of these things will happen sometime between the starting of the 77s and its end. Now notice most of those things aren't done yet. Let's keep that in mind. So we need to know that there's a clear beginning and an end, because, and we can tell that because of how the first section of it is described. There's a from and an until. So let's go verse 25. Know and understand this, Gabriel speaking to Daniel. From the issuing of the decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem, until the anointed one, the ruler, comes, there will be seven sevens and sixty-two sevens. It will be rebuilt with streets and a trench, but in times of trouble. So let's clarify the sevens bit first. It says there will be seven sevens first, followed by 62 more. So you've got a diagram up there to represent that. Now I don't know if anyone's really come up with a satisfactory explanation of what that first division is for. I think the best suggestion is that it's how long it took them to build the city. But the text doesn't say here, and we can't really be sure from other texts, and it doesn't really affect anything as far as what we're looking at today, so we'll move on. What it does say, though, is that the beginning of this time, where the red arrow is there, is when there's a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem. And people get this confused with the decree to rebuild the temple from Cyrus. But it's not that. That was earlier. This is the time of Nehemiah this is fulfilled. And under, as we mentioned before, Artaxerxes Longimanus. And we read about it in Nehemiah chapter 2. And he's the cupbearer to the king and all that. As it turns out, when you work out how they reckon the dates and give decrees in, in that time, in that place, you can pinpoint the actual date this happened. It was March the 14th, 445 BC, according to Robert Anson. Okay, great. So that's the beginning. What's the end? We look at the end. But just keep in mind here that this is the end, not of the 77s, this is the end of, how many are you up there so far? 69. 7 plus 62, 69 sevens. So there's still one un unaccounted for, but we'll get to that. First I want to show you something cool. What marks the end of the 69th seven? When the anointed one, the ruler, comes. And the word anointed one, here is the Hebrew word Mashiach, which we... You know, translate, put in English as Messiah. Okay, so we know who he is, don't we? 
again, it's Jesus. But when did he come and present himself as ruler? Well, we'll get back to that. First, we have some details we can bring with us from earlier on to help us. We have 69 sevens here, right, up on the screen. And we know how long a seven is, right? 2,520 days. So if we calculate 2,520 times 69, what do we get? I don't expect you to know that unless you're one of those people. 173,880 days. Okay, so if we count 173,880 days from the decree of Artaxerxes, where do we land? We we'll land apparently on the 6th of April, 32 AD. Yes, so it just so happens to be, according to our man Robert, the triumphal entry. The only time in his whole ministry when Jesus specifically and deliberately presents himself as the ruler of Israel. Now, I find that pretty amazing. It's crazy. Now, it does make me think back to all those times when Jesus said that his time was not yet. Uh, and Except one time he specifically arranges this event by organising a donkey and everything as if he had a plan. How could he possibly know when this time was? Maybe, well, he's God, that's one thing. But there's also, I think he probably had, could have worked it out from the word. He wrote the word as well, so don't forget that. Just something to think about. Okay, so when that happens, verse 26, after the 62 sevens, so just to be clear, so this is immediately after, is this, is this immediately after the 62 sevens? which actually means after the 69 sevens because we had seven and 62. So, Well, we don't know if it's immediately after, but let's assume so since there's no other information at this point. So we'll put it there. Now, continuing, so after the 62 sevens, the anointed one will be cut off and will have nothing. And again, the anointed one is that word Messiah. So, yeah, so yes, this is Jesus. And to be cut off is a euphemism, euphemism in the Jewish language for being killed. So again, this is pretty easy to identify, right? This is the crucifixion, which happens just a few days after the triumphal entry. So it all checks out so far. The people of the ruler who will come will destroy the city and the sanctuary. The end will come like a flood. All right, so who is this ruler who will come? Some say it's still talking about Jesus, but that would be an odd way of referring to someone who the passage has already been talking about. Why would he introduce him in a different way like that? It makes much more sense to understand this as a new person in the discussion. Especially when you try to match this up with history, it becomes pretty obvious Gabriel is referring to the destruction of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. He's talking about destroying the city and the sanctuary. So incidentally, this would take us beyond that seven, wouldn't it? That final seven, if we put it there. So that's a red flag that something's amiss with our timings here. But we'll continue. War will continue until the end and desolations have been decreed. Well, that sounds like the last almost 2,000 years in Israel, doesn't it? Desolations. It's been desolate for much, much of that time. Certainly the land as a whole. But note that the end is mentioned here twice. So maybe that final seven is still coming. I'm just trying to take this as it comes, you know. So verse 27. He will confirm a covenant with many for one seven. Ah, okay, so here it is. So if this is the final seven, the conclusion we have to come to is that all the stuff in verse 26 must happen between the 69th and the 70th seven. So there's a very long gap to insert. Okay, so now we've got that straight. Who's the he here? So it starts off with he. Well, the subject at this point is the prince who will come. And to cut a long story a little bit shorter, <laughs> this guy is the one we call the Antichrist, also called the Beast in Revelation and all kinds of other titles right through the Bible. And for the first official thing he does to begin his, this final seven is to confirm or really to enhance or increase a covenant with many. So obviously that would be with Israel and who are the many, perhaps several other nations, perhaps the whole world, we're not sure. But this is the event that officially marks the start of the 70th week. And start the stopwatch again. Not the rapture. That happened sometime before this, and maybe only just before. 
And people sometimes get confused on this, but it's this peace agreement that is the starting gun on this final 2,520 day period, which is called, as we mentioned, the tribulation, even though it's the last half of that, that's the worst, as we'll see in a minute. But that's why I wanted to give you some information on the first part of this sermon about what that time will be like, because I want us all to get serious about being prepared by being right before God and to get serious about telling people about Jesus. Because he's the only escape from this time of judgment and God's wrath. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 1 verse 10, speaking of the true God, and to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, Jesus who delivers us from the wrath to come. He's the only way to avoid it. And as Jesus himself says in Luke 21, 36, watch therefore and pray always that you may be counted worthy to escape all these things that will come to pass and stand before the Son of Man. So escape is a good thing. It's okay. You can look for it. And I went with the New King James Version on that one because it preserves the original Greek sense of being worthy. Uh, and we are only worthy when we have faith in Christ. Okay, that's, I just want to clarify that point. It's not about living right necessarily. Well, it's not about living right. It's about being in Christ. We'll all get taken. Okay, back to Daniel 9. So we're in verse 27 still. In the middle of the seven, he will put an end to sacrifice and offering. And on the wing of the temple, he will set up an abomination that causes desolation. So what this means is that in the exact midpoint of the tribulation, 1260 days in, that's half of 2520, he will do as Paul writes about him in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 4. Who opposes and exalts, speaking of this man, who opposes and exalts himself against every so-called God or object of worship, so that he takes his seat in the temple of God, proclaiming himself to be God. So that's the beginning of the, the worst half of the 70th seven. Hence the different coloured part at the end. If I bring that picture up for you. I've got a different colour because that's the hot bit, you know, the worst of it. Uh, but it's not just for the Jews, either. it's focused on the Jews, but it's the whole world. That's when all these worst things we can see coming about now will come about fully with the mark of the beast in full totalitarian control like never before seen on earth. But there is some good news in it all. Firstly, that the six goals we read about in verse 24 in Daniel 9, they will be achieved, which will lead to the most blessed time we've ever seen on the earth, called the millennium. But the other side of the coin is also good news. It's the end of the Antichrist, verse 27, as we finish this up. Oops, I'll put it back one. Until the end that is decreed is poured out on him. So it will not end well for him. His time of full tyranny will be short, only 1260 days. And his end will be eternity in the lake of fire. I'm glad about that. So there you go. I hope all of this has been an encouragement for you in one way or another. And I've just reminded you about the many, many, many reasons we have to stand firm in these last days, last interesting days. So I hope that's been great. So let's pray. Father, your word is astounding to us. Thank you for preserving it for us for all this time and helping us have these insights. Lord, we pray that the truths that you've shown us now will lodge in our hearts and manifest in our lives, Lord, and give us the strength and the courage to be immune from lies and to be emboldened to speak your truth and live your truth amongst the people we're with, wherever we are. So we pray and praise you and we thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.